Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hey, my name is Quinn Jacobson, and this morning, or whenever you're watching it, um, it's morning for me, I am going to do a portfolio review, um, an artist review, whatever you want to call it. Um, some, you know, whatever we want to call it. We can call it whatever we want, but I'm going to do an entire show about uh, the work that I've made over the last, um, it's been almost 20 years now. So we're going to, uh, once we get everybody in here, we're going to go ahead and start that because, you know, the security issues we have on uh, Zoom now, we have to kind of watch, uh, we don't want to get Zoom bombed, right? But maybe it's, uh, maybe it would be fun to get Zoom bombed, I don't know. <laughs> So, good afternoon, good evening, everybody and anybody. I'm glad um, I'm glad you're joining me. Um, it's a real honor to have people spend their time in my world, and that's what we're going to do today. Just so you know, this is not going to be a technical presentation. It's not going to be a how-to. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process, of course, that I work in and some variants thereof because of my work and how I've used it and why I've used it and those kinds of things. But this is not going to be a, uh, a how-to like, like what I've been doing lately on, up here, uh, on Zoom or in here in these Zoom meetings, I guess I should say. So just so you're aware, I just want you to know that before we get started. And once we get everybody in here, um, and it looks like a good crowd. I appreciate you guys coming in. Um, once we get everybody in here, we'll go ahead and get, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I got a little keynote. So how this will work is the first 40 minutes or so. These, these vary depending on how, uh, you know, how deep I want to go. I've slimmed this down just a little bit. This is based on um, my past experience. Um, and I've done a lot of these of making presentations, lectures, talks, whatever you want to call them, for um, artists, uh, galleries, universities, colleges, um, high schools, um, all kinds of all kinds of people, and all kinds of audiences um, that uh, have been interested in my work and and want to know why I do what I do, and and try to figure out some of the reasoning behind it. And I'm going to give you my reasoning, and I'm going to tell you why I've done what I've done, how I've done what I've done, and some of the philosophy and some of the um, some of the insight behind it. So if you if you like that kind of stuff, and you like to uh, hear uh, why an artist does what he or she does, kind of behind the scenes stuff, um, and get some insight into the work rather than just looking at a photograph and saying, oh, that's interesting or that's not interesting. This is going to be something I think you can um, uh, get your head wrapped around. And um, so before I get started, I just want to make sure everybody's in here, gets in here. I appreciate everyone showing up this morning or this afternoon or this evening or whenever you're watching it. I appreciate it. Um, I know, I guess it's a holiday today for a lot of folks. So um, um, I know it's uh, Passover time for, for Jewish folks and um, Easter today, Sunday for Christian folks. So um, I hope you're having a good holiday if you have a holiday. So I didn't realize that. Um, so, well, I did realize it. I just didn't realize that people, I'm, I'm having this event on a, on a major holiday. So anyway, um, we're going to call that good. I'm going to jump in and share my screen right now. And hopefully, hopefully um, I can do this um, and have everybody still... Uh, a better, I don't know if I, I should, um, okay, yeah, there we go. I think, I think everybody can at least come in and see. I don't know if it's recording. Can you guys all see that okay? Can you see that fine? Um, cool. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you guys. I, I actually see you now. <laughs> um, I may want to, uh, I may want to get, uh, move this out of the way since I am recording. I don't know. I don't want to keep anybody uh, keep anybody out. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. I can pop you back up and down. So just sorry. I'm figuring this out as we go. Uh, well, there's still folks coming in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep people coming in here because you know Zoom has increased the security and all that stuff. So we have to kind of go uh, 
do our thing that way. I'm going to move this over here so we can see the screen. And what I'm about to show you is uh, is a present the presentation that I normally give. Like I said, that I normally give to an audience, a very uh, various audiences um, that I've done it, uh, many many of these in the past. I've tried to modify it just a little bit so it addresses things that uh, or topics that you may be more interested in. Um, as an artist, as a student, as, as a photographer that's trying to figure some things out, I hope this will give you um, some food for thought, some fodder, some like, oh, that's how he did it. That's how he he works or that's how, you know, those ideas behind these photographs or, you know, even what types of photographs and, and the processes we're using. So um, I'm going to move this over to the side. I don't, I don't know if that's recording that or not, but anyway. So I'll try to keep my eye on it. I know if I don't admit you, I'll, I'll check that occasionally. If I don't admit you, you can still watch it. At the end, we're gonna have a Q&A session. So if you wanna come in, make some notes along. If you see something and you have a question, jot it down because this is gonna be quite lengthy. And I don't wanna have you guys miss anything if you have some questions. So let's get started. I am, I am psyched to do this. Um, um, I've already skipped off one here, so. Um, I like to, and I'll address this in my resume or my CV here in a minute, but I like to start with this. I like to think that I live in a centric place somewhere between pessimism and optimism. I don't have any big dreams of changing the world with my art, but I do believe art can change the world. I really do believe that. And it has, and it has in the past. Um, that's a little excerpt from my thesis that I, I did an MFA in, um, these historic processes, and I did a body of work surrounding that. I just want to warn some of you guys, um, uh, you may find some of this stuff offensive. Um, it may be uh, a little disturbing, especially some of the text um, when we get to the ghost dance stuff. So I just want to warn you, it's genocide, death, murder, and you, some of you might have problems with that. So I just want to give you a heads up. I, I, it's not intentional. I, I'm not trying to disturb people, but... Um, so here's my CV. I start with this because I want people to know kind of my background, where I'm coming from. Um, currently, I'm 56 years old. I was born in 64. Um, at 18, I joined the military. That's where I kind of got my start in the, uh, in the photography world. Although my family was very active making photographs. We always had cameras. I had a little eight millimeter camera when I was a kid, those kinds of things. And so I was not, it wasn't like I didn't know um, uh, the power of photography in that context, especially as a family unit. Big photo albums, I still have 40 pounds of photographs from uh, my family stuff. I did an undergraduate degree in photography, communication, and visual art. Communication is basically a code word for uh, journalism, photojournalism. Um, and that is uh, really what pushed me off into, uh, into um, getting started in what I'm doing, right? So let me go back here, sorry. Um, I started my Portraits from Madison Avenue project in uh, around the turn of the century. Um, Portraits from Madison Avenue was the first major body of work that I actually employed or, or used the wet clothing process in. And that uh, start, I, I worked on Portraits from Madison Avenue in film uh, for many years before I started uh, in Wet Collodion. And Wet Collodion, I'll talk a little bit about this when we get to that portion. Wet Collodion gave me that, um, th th it was a tool that gave me the, the correct aesthetic for what I was trying to accomplish with that. So, um, but I started that project in around 2000, almost 20, well, 20 years ago, actually. Uh, in 2005, I did my MFA, like I said, in historic photographic processes. I mainly concentrated on wet collodion. I wrote that first book um, on wet collodion during that time. A technical, it was like 30% technical and 70% creative, 60 credit hour course. Um, I thought I was going to go back to teaching um, higher ed. I, I never did. The, the MFA actually took me down a path of personal work and changed my life kind of forever. Um, and then in 2006, I, I'd finished the Portraits of Madison Avenue that you'll see here, and a wonderful lady named Ruth Lubbards gave me 
two, two big gallery spaces to show in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. The first wet collodion show that I actually knew of in, in many years, um, she gave me that opportunity. It was wonderful. Uh, great, great show, great, great exhibition. So that was my first exhibition. There was, um, I don't know, there was probably 40, 45 pieces in that show, something like that, plates, diptychs, triptychs, and, and solo plates. Um, we moved to Europe in 2006. This is where it really started to change. I started working on a project, uh, and my German friends are going to really get on me for this, on this pronunciation, but Vergangenheitsbewältigung, um, meaning uh, the English translation of big compound word, meaning struggling to come to terms with the past. That was shown in Paris as, as a, a group show with Portraits of Madison Avenue, and the show or the Holocaust work that I worked on in Germany was shown together as an as a, uh, uh, exhibition called Glass Memories. That was wonderful. The Santerie Gallery in Paris, um, Pierre Gasson gave me four years there, a show every two years, two shows, and uh, that, that was just amazing. It, it went over beautifully. In 2010, when we were in, in Europe, I, did the, I was fortunate enough to gather up a, a group of uh, wet colonists all over the world. I think there was 50 some artists and 13 countries representing um, uh, Archer's uh, project that we called it In Honor of Archer. Um, I had a, a placard design put on his uh, grave there in Kensal Green Cemetery. It was a wonderful, we had a little exhibition in the Dissenters Gallery. Wonderful thing. Um, I'm forever indebted to Mr. Archer, um, as we all should be, right? I mean, that's what, uh, that's, that's who we're, um, uh, we're writing, standing on his shoulders in this process, if, if you work in this process anyway. Uh, 2011, we moved back to the States. I came back. Um, moved to Denver, we moved to Denver, and I wanted to do a project on being uh, expa an expat five years out of the country, come back, look at the West, um, look at um, the people in the West, where I was born and raised here in, in, in the West, and, and look at it from um, living in Europe and, and living that lifestyle and coming back here and, and, and look at the differences in people and, and, and the place and all that kind of stuff. So I did a a uh, mammoth portrait pr project, most of mammoth, uh, 16 by 20, 40 by 50 centimeter plates, um, called the American West Portraits. And Avedon's a huge influence on me, and that's why I kind of played off of his um, um, uh, work in the 80s in the American West. Um, I call it the American West Portraits, just uh, otherness and people that... Um, um, that kind of embodied um, marginalized communities. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that work. And I did that, I sent that work, went back to Paris in 2012 and, and took that work with, shipped that work over and had an exhibition there. And it's, and it's, showed in a, it's, it's shown in a couple of places in Europe since then. And it's still over there, by the way. Uh, 2013, I started this latest project and this is where I'm probably gonna spend the most time, is the Ghost Dance Project, the Native American Massacre Sites. And, um, and when I say I started working on it, yes, I went out and made photographs, but working on it, what I meant, or what I mean is, is I started researching. I started trying to find the truth about what happened at these sites. <clears throat> and first, I was very influenced uh, and heavily influenced in undergraduate school by the director of the program at Weaver State University. His name was Drex Brooks. Um, and he did, he published a book in 1995 called Sweet Medicine. Um, it, you know, I got to spend some time with him and, and look at what he was doing. And he was traveling to all the massacre sites from Maine to California throughout the United States. And he was working in film, but um, really influenced me and really got me thinking about these kinds of things. And then I've got the book Sweet Medicine, and I, I highly recommend you look that book up and, and get that work. Um, um, and so I, I, I had this, you know, this this drive to find out the truth about what what happened and so i started out thinking that i'd do the american west um, with the massacre sites here in the western united states and that was so overwhelming i spent two years uh, my wife and i drove all the way out to california um, arizona new mexico idaho utah we tried to try to incorporate um, uh, work in there and, and into the project. And it was so vast and so big, I would have been, spent 20 years trying to do that. Um, 
so I narrowed it down in about 2016. I, I just narrowed it down to Colorado. And I selected two sites in Colorado. And you'll see these. One is uh, Sand Creek, the Sand Creek Massacre, about two hours, two and a half hours south, southeast east of here. And the uh, Beecher Island, um, out Battle of Beecher Island. Out just I live right on the plains here, so it's just east of me that way. And spent time in both places working in the last couple of years doing that. And 2014, my wife and I were fortunate enough to be invited by the Chinese uh, uh, China Art Gallery to go to China. Um, the Chinese group of artists invite us over, and we opened up the, uh, the, the Colonial Collective Asia, TCCA. Mr. Gray and, and all the wonderful people over there, we had a good time. We had an exhibition, um, did all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and now, just last year, 2019, I released the uh, Chemical Pictures Limited Edition, and I published some of the Ghost Dance work. I have 52 plates of Ghost Dance. I, I did publish 22 pieces of that. I like to talk about, to give you context about what I do and how I think. And I'm not saying, um, I mean, you can address the questions if you want, but I'm not saying this is gospel, this is concrete. This is how I think about photography and how, how I place myself within that, the context of photography. So when I talk about types of photography, the commercial, uh, the documentary of photojournalism and the fine art, they're all wonderful. They're all great, but at the same time, we have to kind of distinguish the, the context of the work we're looking at, how it was made and why it was made. And these are kind of the large areas that I look at when I talk about this. So commercial photography, commercial artwork, commercial uh, work, period, is to make money. That's the idea, commercial, commerce, right? Um, and you're directed by someone else for the most part. They hire you for your creativity or your technical prowess or whatever, but you're mostly guided by an outside influence. It's not really coming from you necessarily. The ideas are put on you and the concepts are put on you and you're doing it mostly for money. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. If you could, especially now, if you can make a living doing that, do it. Um, documentary and photojournalism where I spent a lot of time. I've worked in all of these, right? I, the first two. I've worked in both of these areas. Um, I worked as a photojournalist for a long time. Um, and, and found that I always wanted to make my own, do my own projects and try to try to get them into publications. And, but the end goal was you're working and trying to make money. And then fine art, where I've spent most of my time now working without uh, the intention of money or commercialism, just working from personal ideas and, and concerns. And I'll, I'll define this next. So how I define, uh, uh, fine art photography or personal work and you can read it there but exploring personal questions ideas or concerns through photographs with no commercial aspirations no commercial um, goals and so to speak right money isn't the motivating factor and defending the work through context and intention e.g exemplar gratis uh, statements right uh, what what your work's about and telling important social and political truths as you see them and creating a catalyst for discourse. And this is really, if, if you were to synthesize how I think about photography and art, art in general, it doesn't even have to be photography. I believe art serves many functions, um, uh, aesthetic beauty and pleasure and all those things, absolutely no question, I, do, I don't argue that at all. But I think the primary function of art for me, the way I see it, is to create discourse or dialogue, to make work, that encourages people to talk about a topic or a subject or, or something that might be difficult to address and, uh, and, and be effective in, in creating that, being a catalyst or a, a starter to start talking about difficult topics. Because I think when we don't talk in, in our cultures and societies, when we don't talk about those difficult things, um, they tend to fester and grow and, and, you know, the old adage of this family that doesn't talk about anything, they stuff all their problems and becomes a real mess. That's how I kind of see the world in general, so to speak, and, and those ideas. Um, so the idea behind saying um, personal questions, concerns, or ideas, something you love, something you hate, something uh, you have questions about, and this isn't about answering questions necessarily. This is about raising, uh, ask, asking questions, actually. It's about bringing um, um, topics up that 
that we can have discourse or talk about. That's, that's a whole idea behind artwork for me. So I do believe that the creator of any work, photography, sculpture, painting, drawing, whatever it is, you should be able to talk about it. You should be able to say why it was made, what the intention of it is, and the context of it. So you bring, it, and even if people don't like it, it doesn't matter if people don't like it, right? Oh, I don't like the way you composed that or sculpted that, or I don't like the color in that painting, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, we're talking about creating discourse. We're talking about concepts. And I'm not saying that the concept is more important than the actual work itself, but maybe I am, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe the work is, is the catalyst, right? To, to get to that point where we can talk about the concepts and, and nothing, I'm not taking away anything from the beauty. You know, I enjoy art. I want to look at the sunset photographs and the driftwood photographs and the beautiful mountain scenes. That's wonderful. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm talking about the context of how I see photography, especially as, an, as a form of art and what its function is or what it should be doing in my mind or to my mind. So let's see if my work actually um, fulfills that. Um, I just want, wanted you to see a couple of, uh, real quick, I'm not going to dwell too long on this slide, but um, um, I just wanted to see some of my, let you see some of my influences. Um, you can pause this if you're watching the video later, or do a screenshot or whatever, but a lot of these folks, a lot of these artists, um, and they're not just photographers, they're writers and filmmakers and, you know, all kinds of people there. And that's just a small list. That, that's who I kind of, if, if somebody were to ask me off the top of my head, this is kind of who I'm influenced by. And so you'll probably see some of that influence in my work if you haven't seen my work before. Um, but those are, those are some of the influences of what, what I do. So let's jump into the, the, the projects. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was it's, it's coming up close to 20 years now. Not that we have to do anything special in 20 years, but um, 20 years of making this work, um, talking about it, thinking about it, writing about it, and, um, you know, I thought it was a good time to do this because I've never done this before in this on video doing this kind of thing. Um, so let's, let's just go through this. Before I show you some of the work, I want you to understand I have four words, those four words there on the screen, kind of like table legs, holding up a table, supporting my work, underpinning my work. Um, and those words are memory, identity, difference, and justice. And a lot of people ask me about these words. What, what do you mean by this stuff? And as you go through my work and you look at my work, um, just think about some of these words, about how I've connected and tied in these words and the, and the definitions, those are just dictionary definitions, uh, but, but that's all I need. That's what they mean, um, and that's how I use them. So every plate I've made, every photograph that I've made, always has some element or multiple um, uh, words. That was, at least one of those words is connected to the image or images that I'm making. And a lot of times, all the words are. Um, and the last word, I, I was, I was uh, queried one time about this graduate, with uh, this graduate student was querying me saying, justice, what do you, uh, I can see the other words, what do you mean justice? And if you read that, just behavior or treatment. And I think as we go through this work, you're going to see exactly what I mean by that. And then on the right side, um, this is primarily uh, an excerpt from my ghost dance work. But, you know, my work is really about thinking about how we treat one another and thinking about people that we other or marginalize or put in um, the other container, so to speak. And that container that we can scapegoat and throw our problems on. And everyone in the world knows who these people are. We, we, all the cultures all over the world have always had these people. It's human nature. And if you read Ernest Becker, you'll understand quickly that it's human nature to create people that we can other, marginalized communities that we can throw our burdens on, that we can scapegoat, right? That, that whole idea of, of putting your sins on that goat and sending them off into the wilderness. So, take that away from me. Get, get out of here, right? Um, and I was introduced to Ernest Becker's writings, uh, sp specifically The Denial of Death, 
And what it did is it, it, you know, I say I don't have any answers and I really don't have answers. I have questions. I don't really have answers. But I have to admit, Ernest Becker's book did in some part answer a, the question of why on all of this for me. Why do we do this to other human beings? People who are different from us can be race, religion, whatever it is. Um, why do we do why do we treat people differently because of, of who they are or what they are or how they look or how they act or how they live? Why do we do this? And if you, if you read Becker's book, it boils down, and I can't go into it in depth here because we just don't have time, but it boils down to our anxiety, our, our, our knowledge of our impending death. Every single one of us knows we're going to die. We don't think about that much, but it's always in our mind. You, you can't get away from this. And, uh, Sheldon Solomon, his protege, has a book called The Worm at the Core, and he, calls, he talks about terror management. And if we didn't have these things to distract us, um, like what I'm doing now, my immortality project, publishing books and making photographs, and we dwelled on the fact that we were going to die, we'd be curled up in a little ball in the corner in the room there. We, we wouldn't be able to function. So we have these immortality projects, we have these things to distract us, but the bad side, on the bad side of all that, is that we act out on people who are different from us, that threaten our, our death denial, our projects, our, our beliefs, our systems. Um, uh, we, we lash out at them because they challenge us, they, they remind us that we're going to die. And that's the best way I can put it, but um, you should read the Death Denial by Ernest Becker, if you're interested in that. That did answer a lot of, uh, of some of the big questions for me. People often ask um, what my influence is, how I work, what do I do, um, um, who am I, wh where am I getting this stuff from? All of my work is personal. And in my thesis, uh, I, it's called Conferring Importance. Um, it's, a, it's a line from Susan Sontag I stole from uh, her book um, on photography. Um, she talks about anytime you point a camera to someone, you're, you're conferring a sense of importance. That's the name of my thesis anyway. Um, in that, I wrote a whole chapter on genetic memory. And, and in 2005, I had my DNA tested. And you can see here, that's a wet clothing of my father on the top left and my mother on the bottom right. And then, then my, my father, my mother in 59. You can see here that I'm about 5% Native American. That's on my mother's side. And I'm mostly 95% European with the Jewish background there. So what I learned in graduate school is I have genocide on both sides of my family. And I got, I got really, I got thinking about, is this affecting me? Is this, is this in my head that I, I didn't, I mean, I heard these stories growing up and all this stuff, but, I, but as I got the science on it and I looked at the facts about it, um, I, I quickly realized that, um, yeah, I'm probably in some context working from that position. And that has a lot, you know, talk about the two, two groups were completely marginalized. Um, it's a pretty good case for that. So anyway, that's kind of the, the emphasis of um, the work is othering, my own personal connection to it, my genetic background, um, the way I think, the way I feel, the way I, you know, maneuver in the world, so to speak. And so this first project that I did called Ports of Portraits from Madison Avenue, and everybody thinks Madison Avenue in New York. It's not. It's in a little podunk town out west here in the western United States in the state of Utah in the city of Ogden. My father owned these low-income apartment complexes, and I used to travel there with him. You can go to my website and read this. This is the artist statement on it. But basically, I am working from the point of, uh, in this body of work, I'm thinking back at eight, nine, 10 years old, traveling with him to these places and seeing these people who are completely marginalized, uh, drug addicts, um, um, uh, ex-convicts, um, you know, uh, these, these people that are just, just thrown away, put to the margins of society. And I had questions about them. And like I said earlier, I worked in film uh, many years on this. And until I got in wet plate and wet plate, you know, like I say there, it's a perfect syntax for my work. I use it as a metaphor as it relates to abandonment. Uh, the process was abandoned and forgotten just as most of the marginalized people are by mainstream. 
And I also embrace it for its imperfections, echoing our and their own human imperfections. Um, very important, very, uh, very um, provocative that way. So this is the work. I'm just going to slide through some of it. Um, <clears throat> I was influenced by this book called Working Stiffs, and I started photographing. And just technically speaking, these are all either whole plate, eight by 10, um, size plates in wet collodion. They're all direct positives, and they're all done with natural window light. And this was, these were very early on. A lot of these are very early on. Um, I don't give them names because I'm trying to work from the perspective of, um, you know, again, uh, playing into our own um, kind of insecurities about that. Um, you know, this, this refers to the war, um, you know, war pigs and the government. And see, even here, I'm, I'm throwing back, if you look at the Yad Vashem and you look at how the Nazis photographed um, uh, the Jewish folks and, and the other undesirables, um, these, these styles. If you watch the movie Paragraph 175 about uh, gay people, um, you, you'll, see, um, you'll see a lot of these. <clears throat> Criminals, sexual predators, drug addicts, um, dealing with, you know, you know I, I, I renamed a couple of these as I use them. I actually use some of this stuff one of the reasons I did glass memories is some of this stuff actually related, correlated so well with the work that I did in Europe after this. Remember, I didn't move to Europe until 2006, and all this was done in the early 2000s. <clears throat> so um, you can see my style wasn't quite as clean, and that's okay. I used to put my thumb print and, and have the sitter's thumb print in the image as well. Um, I like to photograph the objects and, and kind of make drive that point home. Uh, this is a, a man that I grew up with. Uh, I grew up from about five years old to, I guess, maybe junior high or high school here in America. Uh, contacted me some 30 years later. He has a twin brother and a uh, very powerful meeting, very um, interesting meeting that we had, uh, re reunited, uh, so to speak. Um, yeah, even quarter plate you saw there, even the size. So I, you know, again, I work from this position of othering, of uh, authoritative, of um, marginalization, that kind of thing. So now I move on to the next body of work, um, struggling to come to terms with the past. Uh, I started this body of work out. Uh, thinking about the uh, Kristallnacht, November 9th and 10th, 1938, through Germany and some parts of Austria, destroying the synagogues. <clears throat> and I ended up just making work about the marginalized communities. And I just talk about here again, if you, uh, if you, if you go in, um, if you're, if you're watching, or you can go to the web, uh, my website, but if you go in and you watch uh, or, or, uh, uh, we're watching the video. You can pause it and read this. I'm not going to read through this, but basically what it says is Germany living in Europe, dealing with this topic, being who I am, um, really changed what, how I felt and thought about, um, um, I re read Goldhagen's book, um, Willing Executioners, and um, it really changed me being there. And at the end of the day, it was really about me, my own struggle, and um, how I felt about this. And I learned a lot. I, I you know, good things and bad things both. It, it gave, threw me in kind of a tailspin for a while. Um, but at the end of the day, it was a good project for me to do. And I ended up um, making, uh, I think, some, some pretty solid pieces of um, really solid photographs for me, for what I was trying to do. This is my DNA, a self-portrait. This is my DNA written out backwards on a piece of cardboard, kind of like the homeless guy standing on the corner. And then I did three different plates. This ended up being a triptych, but this is my, my Y DNA, my father's DNA that I carry. <clears throat> uh, broken homosexual, you'll see again why I... I don't name the, I really, what I'm doing is I'm objectifying human beings here, which I don't do. Um, it's the last thing I want to do, but in this kind of irony of 
this marginalizing and othering these people um, and myself included, right? Richard Avedon, I love what he says about all portraits are in the end are self-portraits and I do feel that. But I call this broken homosexual because at the end of the day, I took it to Paris and I broke it right before a, a major show. I put it back together and this, uh, and it put it in the show and it actually sold. Um, a very prominent writer of photography, Pierre Baron, owns that plate now. Um, but that's why I call it Broken Homosexual. And it's how ironic that, you know, a black gay man in Germany and, and being translated into wet collodion and then having this happen, it was just, it's just a, an aesthetic that was just so fitting and just so powerful to me. Arbeiter, worker, we lived in this little village called Fierenheim, just outside of Mannheim, 15, 20 minutes from Heidelberg. <clears throat> a cleaning woman, a German cleaning woman. And this is, I, I went to the, this is a piece that I was um, working, uh, when I was working on um, the Kristallnacht side of things, this was in Heidelberg. And uh, there's a synagogue there that was destroyed. And that synagogue had stood there for, for, for for centuries. And this is part, this is what's at the Torah Ark um, at the head of the, where the synagogue used to be. And that road led down to it. Um, somebody's writing on the screen here, aren't they? That's what I was going to say. Can you erase that? <laughs> um, so as we go through these, um, you'll notice they're keyholed, right? They're, they're, they're vignetted. Um, and I did that in this, for the sense of, uh, of looking like you're looking through a keyhole, this vignette. So I used a larger plate and a smaller lens and, um, and got this kind of keyhole effect. And that was, I, I really wanted to give this feeling as you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at. Um, and just, just trying to give that feeling or that look and feel uh, visually. A very powerful time here. If you go to my website and go through these, you can actually click on that. I'm not going to right now. You can click on these links and you can see more of the making of these things. There's a death camp here where I actually worked on that actual concentration camp there. Um, Judas Baum is a Judas tree, and we kind of know about that um, kind of thing. Uh, Seligenstadt in Germany was, was very moving to me. This was a freed uh, um, uh, cemetery, a Jewish cemetery that was raised, uh, that was destroyed um, during the uh, Kristallnacht and all the head, headstones were broken and a lot of them were used in buildings and stuff uh, for, the, for the city there, but some of them were restored. Sometimes I'd find people that I felt, you know, just, just exemplified this look and feel, this kind of serene, uh, that was in Frankfurt. Nordic man. Uh, this is a young man named Aaron. He might even be in here watching. I'm not sure, but I uh, was teaching a uh, workshop in Gothenburg, Sweden. And this young man's got blue eyes and blonde hair and very fair skin. And I looked where he, um, he was from. And he was basically from the, the region there um, that uh, uh, they took the Aryan man kind of look and feel, right? The, the whole... Um, superior race kind of thing and okay, so I, I use that as a, as a Nordic man image. A uh, German prostitute, a uh, German artist in Frankfurt on the river. I used to go up and the, the painters would be painting and I'd, I'd do portraits of people on the river there. Another black man in Germany. Um, I was just very fortunate to get, you know, when the light's right and everything works, it's, it's just a wonderful, beautiful process. Oma, our grandma, she was a neighbor that lived in the house next door to us in Fierenheim. Uh, there was a, Jew, a Jewish uh, a doctor and her daughter that was removed from there in, in, 19, in early 40s and taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau and murdered. And they live in that house. And uh, I became friends with her and um, her grandson. Now we come back to America, moved back to America in 2011. And like I said earlier, I wanted to come back with kind of the expat eyes and do a, a project on um, my people, so to speak, if you will, you know, being from the West and, and living out here. 
Um, and I, that's what I say. I return to America. The faces and people are more interesting to me now than when I left. I mean, this body of work with fresh expatriate eyes. I was born in the American West and lived in the American West for most of my life. It's interesting, dangerous. Um, there's still a remaining sense of the frontier and the possibility that anything goes in the Wild West. And that's kind of the, the emphasis that I wanted to make. And you can see all this work leading to this ultimate kind of ghost dance stuff that we're going to look at here. But I'm just going to go through some of these plates and, and show you um, what I did here in Colorado returning back. And again, these are all images. Um, to this point, you haven't seen one plate that's not made with natural light. And I don't think you will. Uh, there's no, I don't have any images in here that weren't made with uh, sun, uh, natural window light, north facing light, or natural light. Um, so yeah, I, I here you can start seeing the influence. Here's the Bowie knife, um, Mr. Gardner here. The Bowie knife played a critical role, same with the Colt uh, pistol in, the, in uh, taking the land in the American West here from uh, the Native Americans, especially the, the two weapons that really devastated them. You can see that I'm doing some large plates, the 16 by 20 or 40 by 50 centimeter glass uh, plates. Cannabis farmer, before it was actually legalized here, it was kind of interesting to explore that. Wing walker, this young lady, um, go up in an airplane and then go out and she had her wing walker goggles and I thought that was uh, fascinating and kind of uh, interesting community. Paleolithic man, friend of mine, a friend of ours named Jody. Um, he tells these really fascinating stories about ordering Chinese food and the people laughing at his name, Jody, and um, very interesting. Uh, beautiful light, blue eyes, you can tell he's got light eyes, right? I mean, Sarah's tattoo is a wonderful story about um, her mother, her and her sister in the back seat of the car on a Christmas Eve and getting her mother getting killed um, in the car, uh, getting hit going through an intersection and these tattoos represent that, that experience. Normally I'd never objectify or block a face out like that, but it was just so powerful to photograph her that way. Kylie's dreadlocks, an intern from Nederland, uh, um, Colorado, up in the mountains. She spent about six months in the studio, photographed her a lot. Cowboys and Aliens, if you've ever seen that movie, uh, this is the fiddle player, his name is Rex. Um, I don't know who made the film, I can't remember. And Blind Artist, all those are, are, are mammoth plates, or most of them are mammoth plates. Now we come to Ghost Dance, um, the Native American massacre sites. And these are just two sites in Colorado that I, that I actually concentrate on and, and um, work, work in or work with, so to speak. <clears throat> And again, I'm not going to read this. You can pause the video or go to my site and read it or whatever you want to do. But um, the bottom line is um, the, the sweet medicine, the Cheyenne prophet code up top is very powerful about prophesying what's going to happen. And then Colonel John Shivington, who I'm going to mention a lot through this presentation. Um, I've come to kill Indians and believe it's the right and honorable thing to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Uh, you get the idea and the, of uh, what, what, how they felt about what was about um, they were about to do or doing, in fact, doing in that case. Um, I'm going to talk about um, all of these still lifes that you see in this work are objects that I um, objects that I found on the sites and I brought back to the studio and I photographed and they all have meaning and I'm going to describe that or talk talk to you about that. Um, here in just a bit uh, as we go through some of these. <clears throat> really bizarre to find, um, you know, abandoned sofas out in the middle of the Eastern Plains in Colorado where the Cheyenne and Arapaho and the railroad tracks are. And, and one of the beautiful things about this image, and one of the things I really find profound is that little cross, that telephone line or that power line, that little cross up there right above that scene of death and destruction or decomposition or whatever you want to call it. Little subtleties all through these images that I just find um, uh, powerful uh, telling the story of this kind of stuff. 
one of the only people, and, and he should be revered, and he is, but the only, one of the only people, Captain Silas Sewell, um, he resisted Shivington's orders to massacre the Indian people at Sand Creek. And I was fortunate enough to be at his gravesite on Memorial Day and have these flags. It wasn't really planned. I just ended up being there. And these little ghost images through the plate um, took us a little while to find his grave, but um, we found it. And the Native Americans every year, the Arapaho and Cheyenne, uh, run from Sand Creek all the way up to this grave in Denver, his grave in Denver. Fox jaw and bullet holes. Um, these, uh, when I talk about, these are six by six or 15 centimeter negatives and they're pot prints, meaning they're mostly, with the exception of where I say, they're collodio chloride prints or um, collodion aristotypes, just as on the technical note. And these are all objects or, or material from massacre sites. The cottonwood tree limb behind there, the can with the bullet holes, the fox jaw, and the thistle. We'll all talk about that as I go along here. But this is where I first start, um, want to kind of address, if I can move this here, I don't know if I can. Um, sorry, let me go back here. I was just trying to move that uh, bottom piece. Um, you can read that, it's powerful. This is Big Sandy Creek, um, what they called that, um, Sand Creek Massacre site. Um, you can, you can read that. I, I get choked up reading it. Um, it's about the execution of a little uh, three-year-old. He says probably three-year-old, just big enough to walk through the sand. Um, he talks about Major Scott Anthony here. And th these quotes are all taken from, you know, testimony, congressional or Senate testimony here in the U.S. about the Sand Creek Massacre and, and what happened. And, and just, just horrible, horrible stuff. Just horrible stuff. <clears throat> so in, in the book, if you have the book, you'll see that I have the negative and the positive. Um, and, and here, I'm, I just want to show you a couple of technical things. Here's the negative. Here's the pot print from it. And this is a site, again, another site with, with a sign that it just kind of the irony of keep out. Um, just kind of wordplay on that. But... <clears throat> In the text, we talk about Shivington dressed their weapons, hats, and gears with scalps and other body parts, and including human fetuses and male and female genitalia. That's how cruel this stuff was. I mean, I don't think people realize that or understand that, but that's how cruel um, this stuff happened or this, what went down. This is an oil print, and this is a series I'm doing now. I'm taking all the wet collodion negatives, or, or a, let, let me say a set of them, not all of them. I can't do 52 prints, but I'm going to do about 15 or 20 prints, uh, a lot of what you see here, and make Rollins oil prints from them. This is rolled out pigment and ink. There's no silver in it. That's a little technical series I'm doing right now. Um, it, just to show you the difference of uh, what they look like, how, how much more painterly and pictorialist they look. So they're the rabbit skull and the oak galls. So Native American lore portrays rabbits as ingenious and often humus, hum, humorous tricksters. Uh, association with rabbits is that of a fear caller. It's said that when rabbits fear something, it calls out to that thing until noticed. In nature, rabbits live in fear. The Native American lesson here is that calling to what frightens you, constantly fo focusing on it, can fo foster manifest manifestation of that very thing in your life. And the oak galls, the oak galls grow on these big oak trees in the Eastern Plains. And that oak tree, um, very important to the culture here, the culture, um, that oak tree, the, a wasp comes along and lays eggs under the bark, infests the tree, and the tree, it can't swat the uh, wasp away, it can't do anything other than put, send out these chemical signals and it builds this uh, shell around the eggs because they infest the tree, they kill the tree. So this invader gets swallowed up in this ball. They call them galls, oak galls. And these galls uh, fill up, grow, and then drop off the tree. So they contain their invaders and then drop off the tree, which I found fascinating and interesting. So I like to photograph quite a few of those. Um, you'll see them often here. Abandoned military uh, equipment and dirt teepees. 
uh, just a bizarre scene here on the Eastern Plains. Um, and I have this little reference, the ghost dance was a ritual dance that was believed to drive away white people and restore the traditional lands and ways of life, a way of life for the American Indian. That's what I call the overall project is ghost dance, but um, very bizarre scenes. Here's <clears throat> tree people, the Sand Creek Massacre site itself. This is where people were actually massacred and way in the distance on the horizon, you see the other portion of it where the trees are. Um, you can pause this or read this here, but um, they were said, there are some counts of up to 600 Cheyenne and Arapaho were murdered here. Most of them women and children. And I've already talked a little bit about how they were massacred. They were, they were slaughtered. They were uh, um, chopped up. Uh, their body parts um, taken, you know, just right there. It says Shivington organized for the body parts of the slaughter to be taken back to Denver for a display in the Apollo Theater and for a one mile long parade down Larimer Street, about 20 minutes from where I live. There's a no trespassing, another pot print. <clears throat> bones and twigs in the foreground. Thistle, a 19th century opiate bottle, um, Eastern Plains. I, the, the thistle you see come up in this work quite a bit, um, and I'll explain that in the next slide, but uh, Drex Brooks, I quoted his book a couple of times in the work, and this is one of them. This is by um, um, uh, Limerick, uh, uh, I can't remember her first name. She teaches up at uh, CU Boulder here, but they say, uh, she says, we live, these photographs tell us, in a state of blunted feeling, capable of cheering, cheerful indifference when we visit land once steeped in human agony. Contemplating this indifference can be, at first, infuriating. Americans ought to know what acts of violence bought them their right to own land build homes, use resources, and travel freely in North America. That was so profound to me when I read that. And if you stand on these uh, sites and you, you're, you're around this, you, you can't help <clears throat> but say, wow, this is, uh, yeah, how do, how do I deal with this? How do I contemplate this stuff? Here's some spear thistle from the Sand Creek Massacre site again, uh, and a quote from Ma Major Jacob Downing, the third Colorado Calvary. And this spear thistle uh, is a species native throughout most of Europe. It was also naturalized in North America and is an invasive weed in many areas. It sure is here. <clears throat> and it's a national flower of Scotland, which I was surprised to find. The, the flower, that bright part you see on there is actually purple. It's bright purple. That's why it's kind of shining and gleaming. But as an invader, anything invading, anything taking over, I, I thought it was representative of this uh, kind of uh, feeling of what happened here. These are railroad tracks out east here. This is where trains came down. These very tracks um, westbound and they shot buffalo by, by the droves. They just leaned out, leaned out of the train with their 3030s and all their weapons and just dropped buffalo by the thousands. Almost drove them to extinction. Why did they do that? Well, you take the buffalo away from Native Americans and you're basically taking their food and their shelter and their clothing away. That was the idea behind it. And I'm gonna close with this. There's some, there's some information there about my social media and my web presence. Um, pause it, stop it, screenshot it, whatever you wanna do. And then I'm gonna take some questions here um, if we want to, but I need, just need to, to thank uh, my wife, Jeannie, and my daughter, Summer, and, and all of you out there that supported me. So I appreciate you spending a little time with me this morning and letting me go through this work and sharing this work with you, because um, it, it means a lot to me. And I hope you got something out of it. I hope it, uh, I hope it, um, it meant something. I hope it, uh, ooh, we have a whole bunch in the chat there. I hope it meant something, and um, I know that's not all of it, um, and if you have the book, there's a lot more in there. Um, there's a lot more to talk about, but at the end of the day, where I come from, the work, uh, the photographs that I make need to be connected to myself somehow. I need to have what we call skin in the game, and we need to be able to um, have the um, have the uh, 
the ability to talk about it. And, and I, hope, I hope that made sense to everybody. I, I will definitely open this up. Um, thank you, Peter. I will definitely open this up to any questions that anybody might have. And if you don't, that's fine too. But, um, you know, again, it was not, uh, uh, I guess, I guess the end, at the end of the day, it's just about having the ability to, to make your work that's connected to yourself and then the, the questions that you have about the work that you can share with others in a, a, co a co coherent and, and logical way, I guess, if you want to say it. This is, I don't know how much logic plays into this, especially when you're talking about so much death and massacre and mayhem. But in this case, it is, it's how human beings uh, treat one another, how the questions that I have around that treatment and why we do that to other people. And then, and then eventually, the, at the end of the day, is there the big question, the big takeaway from this, and, and, and I'll a, a answer or ask my own question, what's the big takeaway from this? The big takeaway from this is, is there anything that, uh, is there anything that we can do um, to, to help this? Is there, my goal is to throw a little stone in your shoe or make you think about some things, make you think, especially if you're American, or even European or any, any culture, it doesn't really matter. But Americans and Europeans have a direct connection to that last body of work, directly responsible. I can't give this land back to the Arapaho or Cheyenne. I'm living on their land right now as I sit here. I can't give it back. Um, I can't make it better for them. I can't, I, I can't do any of that. I, all I can do is ask my fellow man, um, is there anything we can do to prevent this, right? In German, we say, nie wieder, never again. But it always happens again. We have Cambodia and Pol Pot, we have Darfur, and we have Rwanda. We have, we have all this stuff going on in the world that never stops. And we say, nie wieder, nie wieder, but it doesn't stop. Oh, great, we got something here. I can, no, so no, oh, what wonderful, wonderful, uh, Fareed, that's great. Yes, I agree. This is what I like about photography. I, I love it. I do love that. I love being able to get it. Uh, Ghost Dance is a great, thank you, Kareem. Uh, great body of work. Do you plan to print a photo book of this project? Yes, I plan to do a um, part of this. It's going to be a small one, 20, probably 20 pieces. Uh, thank you for the question, by the way. 20 pieces, and I plan to do um, the oil print and have those translated and do a high quality, not a just a technical book. I, I wanted to share some of it, and the, the quality is low in those, but do a book. I would love to do a 20-piece um, book on ghost dance with the text, with the citations, with the congressional testimony, um, those kinds of things. Thank you, John. I remember long ago I had mentioned of you connecting with concentration camps in the KCN. And the, oh, oh, I love, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that up. John just asked about, um, um, some materials, how I connect the material with the concept, right? So not only does this process give us or give me this wonderful aesthetic, this memory, right? Uh, one of my words that we throw back and the very aesthetic of this process gives us that idea of memory, um, <clears throat> even though it's present. I guess I'll photograph some memory, right? Susan Sontag. Um, but he's talking about connecting the materials with the uh, process and the, co the co process with a concept. Uh, one good example of this that I can give you, I could probably give you several, but this is the one that stands out that John just mentioned. I'm in Mainz, Germany, a college town, a university town, and I'm photographing the remains. There's a couple of pillars of a synagogue there, just, just a couple of pillars, nothing else. The rest are apartments and buildings, and there's once a great synagogue that stood there, and I'm photographing these remains, and I'm, I, most of my work in that project was on black glass. So there I am standing there pouring collodion on glass, you know, Kristallnacht, on glass, and I'm fixing in potassium cyanide, Zyklon B, the very compound they used in the gas chambers. And I started all these, you know, all this material and connection and concept started revealing itself. I noticed that as I got deeper into projects, the more revelation from the process I had, whether it was materials, whether it was, um, uh, bits and parts of, 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 of the history of it, whatever it was, it started 
connecting, connecting, connecting. Just like in that first project, the Portraits of Madison Avenue, I talk about uh, being abandoned and being um, 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 defective, if you will, the, the imperfections. I know everybody talks about that now, but this, I wrote that almost 20 years ago. So a lot of this stuff is just reiterated, right? It's things we discover about it and we either find that kind of beauty in it, that wabi-sabi, that kind of strange beauty in it, or we connect it to something. And I connect, it, I connect these things, whether it's the cyanide and the gas chambers and working on Kristallnacht or the show or the Holocaust, or whether it's being abandoned and using an abandoned process, it's a little difficult and dangerous, kind of like the people I photograph. So thank you for that, John. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do we, do I, Beverly asked, do I shoot any other format? Um, yeah, I shoot, uh, um, if you're, are you talking about size? I, my favorite formats are half plate, which is a little larger than four by five, whole plate, which is six and a half by eight and a half inches, and 40, uh, 16 by 20. And, and this whole last project was shot on six by six or 15 centimeter square stuff. Um, technical question. What lens did you use in Germany? Very shallow, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's Thank you. Yes, um, the lens I always used, the entire project in Germany was shot on my Deroji F 2.8. It's a 220 millimeter, a 22 centimeter lens. And I made most of the images on whole plate. So it vignetted, again, that kind of keyhole effect. Um, I was shooting portraits and landscapes and everything on a Petzval lens. Um, I wanted to give this kind of mysterious, dreamy, dark, looking through a keyhole, like you shouldn't be looking at something that you're looking at. Um, I wanted to give that that feel of that and, and the, the connection to the gas is, is very important. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I appreciate those comments. The idea behind this, and if I could recommend anything to, to photographers or artists working and that are kind of struggling to say, oh, I don't have a project or um, I don't know why I really make the photograph. He's asking why I make them. I make the photographs because it's fun or they're beautiful or, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's fine. But if you're looking, if you, if you have, you know, questions, if you have burdens, if you have like something you wake up with, you, you know, I say a little stone in my shoe, right? Something that bothers you constantly. Um, explore that because I found that art photography specifically for me the medium i use is so cathartic it's so therapeutic it, it it allows you to express you learn about yourself you learn about how you you know i always think it's it's that like it was kind of like my project right I, i'm always pointing the finger about oh it's it's not my problem it's their problem right and what this has done is it's it's a lot of my problem it's how i think about things how i feel about things and and photography and art has allowed me to uh, work through those things and realize that, no, a lot of it's right here. You know, a lot of it's looking right back at the mirror, in the mirror at you. And so if there's something bothering you, art is a great way. And if you're a photographer, photography is a great way to explore concerns, ideas, questions. Um, it's just a really wonderful medium to work in to address those things. And then, not only address it, learn about things. Uh, you know, in German, in German, we uh, Weltanschauung. You know, your worldview, grow your worldview. Have have a big. Americans have this terrible habit of living in a little tiny bubble, and they think the whole world is is that little tiny village or town they live in, and that's how the world works. And uh, it's not, and it's dangerous to live that way. So. Even if you live in a little town and you feel that way or think that way, photography will allow you to expand that worldview. And once you, in my case, once you, uh, you know, live in di different countries and travel the world and see how other people live, you realize how small and insignificant you are. And, and that brings a, a, a little bit of, um, you know, humbles you a little bit, takes the hubris, the pride away a little bit. And that's a good thing because then you don't cause problems or as many problems for the world as, as people who, who think they may be better or superior. And we see this rising up all over the world now. We see this whole thing coming back around, visiting again. 
you know, knee eat or knee eat or never again, never again. We see it coming back around in, in many countries in the world. And it's frightening to me. It scares me a little bit, to be honest with you. So um, absolutely, you know, absolutely investigate and, and, and drill down and start thinking about, you don't even have to get your camera out. You don't have to make any photographs. You can start writing, uh, researching, reading on topics and things you're interested in, and then, and then find a vehicle. Maybe it's not photography. Maybe it's writing or sculpture or music or, or you know, glass blowing or, you know, what, whatever medium you want to use. It doesn't have to be photography. What it, has to, what it has to be is something that you're connected with that you have a question or a concern about. And that's what's driven me for the last 20 years with this work is I have questions. Why, why, why do we treat each other like this? And, and as I walked the streets of Germany 10 years ago, I used to think, wow, if they did a DNA test on me 75 years ago here, I'd, I'd be in an oven. I'd, I'd be put in that chamber over there, right? I mean, it's a powerful thing um, to think about. And, and artists um, help inform the world and help make the world a better place. I said in the beginning, you know, I don't have any, any aspirations of changing the world. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm naive, but I'm not, not that naive. But I believe art can change the world, and it has and it does. And, it, and if I ever play any tiny, in, tiny bit of a role in that, that may, man, that is, that is better than selling out a show or, or making the most money you can make. I think that's the greatest contribution you can make to the world. And as artists, we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to make work that makes a difference. And, and it can make a difference for beauty and pleasure and all those things too, right? I mean, that's a valid thing. Um, but, but I've always been kind of a serious guy and, um, and I like to tackle the big stuff. I like to go out there and wrestle with those big questions like genocide, like, like learning about my own heritage and, and wondering what would have happened to me. What is my responsibility, right? What is, what is uh, you know, <clears throat> In the Reformed um, area of Judaism, I'm not religious, but I'm uh, in, the, in in Juda Reformed portion of Judaism. They have the saying "Tikkun Olam," meaning you know you you leave the world a better place than you found it, and that's a that's a really beautiful thing. And if people concentrate that on that a little bit more, I think we're all selfish. I'm selfish. Uh, you know, I live my life. I I want my things and my th gadgets and my you know material stuff. But if we just stop every once in a while and think about how can I contribute? How can I make the world a better place? Um, every once in a while, uh, I think art gives you that, the ability to do that. And, and I think fine art or personal art or making art from your heart and your head and then sharing it out and saying, hey, does anybody relate with this? Do you feel this? Do you think about this? Does this mean anything to you? Most people will say, no, I don't care about that. I don't like the photographs. I don't. I'm not interested. And that's fine, right? Um, but those that do, that's all you're concerned with, right? It's like the starfish on the beach. Thousands and thousands of starfish washed up on the beach and the guy's throwing them back. And they say, why are you trying to, you'll never get all those starfish back in there. It doesn't mean anything. And so it means something to that one. He throws it back, right? So that's the kind of thing that I try to do for the people that spend the time and understand why I've done the work that I do and the reasons behind it. Right or wrong, you know, I'll, I'll defend my work. Right or wrong, people can challenge me on it, and that's fine. But right or wrong, I'll continue to make my work and continue to work in the, in the areas that, I, that interest me most. I find as I'm, I'm growing a little older now, not that I'm old, but as, I, as, I, as I'm growing a little bit older, I'm finding that uh, the aesthetic, the, the, the pictorialism and the the not straight photography and, and those kinds of things, the more poetic imagery are really appealing to me. I don't know what my future has in store for photography or work. Um, I don't think anyone does. We're living in a very bizarre time right now anyway, but at the end of the day, I feel like um, I'll continue in some capacity to ask questions about really difficult topics and try to engage people, try to create that catalyst for discourse and try to create some conversation about really tough topics. Oh, can you talk about your first plate ever made? You know what? I would love to. 
uh, Beverly. And I wish I wish I would have gotten that out. It's packed in the in the staging area over here that we have. Um, it took me eight months to make this, and this was actually an eight by ten uh, uh, clear glass ambrotype. Um, and I've shown it in exhibitions before, just to say this is my very first plate. And some of you may have seen it. It's my arm. It's my hand all black with clothing and silver, and it's my arm, and it looks like my arm's chopped off. It's like a still life laying on a on a on a you know background like a cove background and it looks like my arm is chopped off where the plate ends it looks like an old civil war thing and my my fingers are all black and clothing covered and silver covered and the the plate's starting to fade and 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 get these talbot rings at the bottom and things like that i think it'll last i don't know it's lasted almost 20 years now so um but it took me eight months and i'm a pretty diligent guy it took me eight months to get that first plate and when it showed up and it was a proper exposure and it fixed out and it, I could put it against black and look, oh my God, it was just so amazingly um, exciting. Not just for the fact that I accomplished something technically, but that I had this new tool, this new arrow in my quiver that I could pull out and use for my work. And that was the portraits from Madison Avenue work. And I knew, I absolutely knew that uh, this process, this, this positive process in wet clothing was the variant, the process I wanted to use to do that work with. Because I was familiar with it. I had an undergraduate degree in photography. I knew about wet collodion. I'd printed albumin stuff in the 90s through a printmaking class, early 90s actually. So I knew about it and I knew it would make a perfect aesthetic. So I was not only excited about the technical accomplishment after eight months and a lot of money <laughs> trying to figure this out, but I was also excited and maybe even more so about being able to use it for the work. And that's really what my goal was. I, I love a challenge, but I love to have a challenge that, that has a, an end goal too, right? I mean, some purpose, some reason for doing it. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I always like to, I always think about my first place. Some people say, I don't know what my first plate was. Man, if you struggle, you know what your first successful plate is. Whether, whatever, whatever it's your first print in carbon, whether it's your first ambrotype, whether it's your first negative, whatever it is, you'll remember that, especially, you know, those, those are the great things that, to work for. Absolutely, Beverly, you're very welcome. Those are the great things to work for. I always, I always make this reference. Um, when people talk about, um, digital photography versus collodion or some other process that's more hands-on, any, any of these historic processes. Um, <clears throat> talk about, uh, uh, you know, digital sitting, you know, shooting a thousand frames or 2000 frames and downloading them into Lightroom or whatever you're doing. And I always make this analogy. Would you rather have fresh squeezed orange juice from fresh oranges or frozen concentrate from the freezer? Would you rather have an email or a handwritten letter from a good friend? Would you rather have a wonderful homemade burrito from the best chef in Oaxaca, Mexico, or a 7-Eleven or store-bought frozen burrito? Those are the kinds of things that I think about when you work for something, when you put that love and labor and that um, Baudelaire, the French poet, uh, poet always said, you know, uh, photography can't be art. Art must contain a piece of the man or woman's soul, right? He's talking in reference to how mechanical it was. He'd be rolling in his grave today, right? Um, and I always say, you know, the hand of man is always in these processes. You see our, our hands and fingers all over this stuff and somebody's worked for it. Somebody's cut that glass and cleaned it and made that chemistry and struggled with exposure, or struggled with prints or struggled with this or that. There is love and labor in that. And that shows like a fresh squeezed, fresh glass of fresh squeezed orange juice or a handwritten letter or that wonderful burrito kind of thing. We, yeah, that's a great way to put it, Kareem. He says, we are analog beings, therefore we, yes, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, if you, did you guys ever read the, um, the uh, beware of images quote about the uh, copy of the copies being, you know, the authentic going away? I think that's kind of in reference to that as well, too. I think that's a very good point. Um, uh, the farther we get away from the authentic and the original, 
the more difficult life becomes. And I think we, we're starting to see that a little bit, right? Our heads are always down on the phones and our, you know, you know, our lives are all kind of virtual and digital and stuff. And I don't mean to put this down. This is wonderful, but you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, well, thank you very much. I'm just over an hour and um, I wanted to keep it at that so I can upload this. If you guys have anything else. Oh, th David, you don't know how much that means to me. He says, inspiring. I have a new appreciation of the stories behind your work. Thank you. You know what? That's that's more meaningful to me. If people can get the ideas, get where I'm coming from, even if you disagree with it or whatever, if you get that, that I've communicated an idea to you that I'm trying to communicate and a question that I'm trying to ask or partially answer or give some explanations for it. That's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for that. Please so, yes, please. I have two, a really quick two-parter. First of all, how far to, do you take a, a an amber type or a, or a tin type in the field? And has there ever been a project where you've decided, you know what, I want to continue this. I want to I want to to finish. I want to varnish my negative, and I want to expose my pop print there in the field. And and what made you think that? Is there some, a project that you're like, you know, I really I really want to reconnect with this with this location, and I want to take it further if you know what I'm trying to, trying to get to. That's a great question. Let me see if I can answer this, John. I think, I think um, you mean physically being in that location and working there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, let, let me give you an example of what I've done in the past, uh, similar to that idea. Um, there is a, a, one of the massacre sites that I photographed. I photographed three dead sunflowers. And after I made that, it was a whole plate, a horizontal whole plate negative, I took one of those sunflowers down and I brought that back. I couldn't stay on the uh, property. I couldn't stay on the land, that site. So I took a piece of the site back, like I have done a lot with all these still lifes. But in this case, I broke that sunflower, that dead sunflower up and I put it in a, in a can, a soup can, took the label, I put it in a soup can, put it in my barbecue and turned it to a carbon six or charcoal. I put a, took that in a mortar and pestle and ground that up, charcoal, ground that charcoal up and sprinkled it in the tissue, the ink, the, the glop from a carbon print. And I made that print, that, that sunflower print with the actual sunflower from that land in that print. Um, trying to bring the land and bring the history into that. As far as staying on the land, that's probably the closest I could say and or bringing material back, little skulls and bones. I have a lot of bones. I have a fox jaw, you saw this, a rabbit skull, galls, pieces of cotton wood. Um, I, I try to take some of, the, some of the pieces with me, understanding that they may have not been there at the time that all this happened, but they, they lived there, they were grown there, they, whatever it was. And that's how I kind of bring that back. And, and I'm not a, still life photographer or necessarily a landscape photographer and primarily a portrait photographer. So this, this ghost dance really challenged me. There's absolutely no portrait, human portraits in this work. So the land was very important. And I wish I could go out and process everything on site. I wish I could go out, make negatives and redevelop and, you know, coat paper and print and all that stuff. But it's just too, it's just too much. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Dave Hunt says he Scottish Highlands and Jacobite history, feeling inspired to do more research. Ah, that's so cool. That's such, what a compliment that is. That's wonderful. Uh, tech question. Do you shoot your portraits with available light only? Yes. Um, Beverly, that's a great question. And all of my, you will rarely, unless it's a workshop, you will rarely see any of my personal work made with other than natural sunlight. I don't use strobes, I don't use CFL, that, that's what's shining on me now in some of my studio lights. Um, I use all natural sunlight, available, beautiful light. I, I think that is one of the keys, and, and I understand people working in, you know, north of the 40, 50 line, you know, up, you know, longitude, latitude, there's no sun, and I get it, I do. But at the end of the day, this process responds to that actinic UV light, and the best 
that's out there. It comes from that big ball in the sky. And if you have that or some portion of that, I recommend you using that. But if you need to make plates or want to make plates, artificial light works too. It's just my particular preference, especially when I'm making negatives. And I've made negatives, I've, I've exclusively made negatives now for so long that I need that natural light. And if I want to make a negative, I have a north facing window right over here. A lot of those still lights you saw in Ghost Dance, um, not a lot of them, all the still lights were made with that north lit window light. I have a scrim on it and I, you know, they're between 20 seconds and a minute and a half for exposures, but it's north light. It's beautiful. At least I love it. I think so. Marcus, thank you, buddy. Oh, I, all of you have helped me, and I'm, I'm glad to be any part of helping anybody, um, especially if you're working toward making the world a better place, uh, bringing joy or beauty or inspiration or information, questions, concerns. I think art, like I said, is just a wonderful thing to do that. Yes, um, I do have a mobile dark box. It's a wooden dark box. Um, you know what I can do? Do I have a, I, I thought I had a photograph of it here. Um, you can see it on the back of my uh, truck there. That It sits on the tailgate of my truck there. It's not very large. I can do up to eight by 10 plates in it, but it's got a little glass window in it that I have a piece of red glass or I have an LED, red LED in there if the sun's not shining or I don't have enough light. So yes, I, I do. All of this ghost dance work, other than still life, we're done in the Eastern Plains here in Colorado or in the San, big Sandy Creek or the Sand Creek area um, southeast of here. Hey, Quinn, I don't yes, know if this sir. works. Yeah, I, I'm having technical problems or I don't understand it. Oh, hey, no. this is Doug. Hey, Doug. Um, Good to see you, buddy. I, one thing that I hadn't told you, we were, uh, we were in Germany last um, fall. Yeah. And when you said never again, something that really made a lot of sense to me. And you say, what can you do? Um, what, you know, we, we saw where the trials took place. And then we saw, and I don't remember the name, the stadium where famous Hitler had his, his big rallies. Yeah. And the one thing that our tour guide pushed that just blew my mind was they are re-educating. They took it out of all the, the whole German, the, 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 the Jewish uh, uh, Holocaust, they've taken it out of their, their um, education books, their textbooks. And this, his group, in fact, I gave him your name and I, I don't know that he ever followed up, but um, you know, they're trying to re-educate. So when you say never again, the big thing is if you never, if you never knew it happened in the first place, this, I mean, this is something you can do to just bring it to light. You can't exactly. learn what you don't know. So and, well said, Doug. Absolutely. And you know, and, and, you, and you know that you know to your point, that's that's very interesting, and it's absolutely true. And to your point, what's happening as well too. Not only do we have these changes politically and socially, uh, what's happening is the survivors are now dying off. They're in their 80s and 90s, yes. and they're dying off. So there's no real human beings now that have actually lived through that and experienced that. So now as we get further and further from history, this is what starts to happen. It, it's toned down, it's taken away, it's not talked about. And what does that set us up for? That set us, sets us up for another incident. And you know, some days, some days I can see this in parts of the world, and some days even in my own country, the, the, the stuff that's going on sometimes that really concerns me. Nobody's being rounded up and all that kind of thing. But you start seeing these attitudes and these inklings of like you're talking about. What, what if I don't know about it? Never again, Neve Eater. That, that means nothing to me if I, if I don't know if it's even happened, you know. Um, it's a very good point, Doug. And it's scary. And again, not that we're making, not that I'm making photojournalism or documentary work by, by telling this story. There's truth to it. But it's my truth, my, my little T truth, and there's big T truth to it as well, too. And that big T truth is that it happened. And we can't let any group of people go uh, be subjected to that by any peoples or governments or institutions ever, ever, ever again. Thanks, Greg. Th thank you for that, Doug. I appreciate that. 
Yes, he says, uh, John's a reenactor, Civil War reenactor, happening to Civil War history too. Yes, it, I've read articles about that. Yes, that is very true, John. That's absolutely true. Uh, Beverly says, I shoot 24 in frames, but soon just one plate at a time. Any advice? <laughs> yeah, I, here's my advice, and anybody can jump in on Beverly's question. Here's my advice. Enjoy that journey. Enjoy spending time thinking about that one plate, that one frame. Think about, recompose, take your time. Don't rush through it, work for it, fail, fail again, fail another time. And by the time you get that, that's gonna be so special to you, and that's gonna be so special to the people around you and the people that you share it with, that you're never going to regret getting something so fast and easy like digital. Digital has uh, democratized photography, kind of like the, Kodak, the Brownie, the Kodak camera in 1899, you push the button, we do the rest. And that's a beautiful thing in one way, but if you're talking this context that we're talking about today, it's, uh, it can be very detrimental to people. It can be very disabling to people in the way they think and the way they approach work and how they think about work. And I, I, I'm not anti-digital. People think I'm anti-digital. I am not anti-digital. There's a wonderful work made with it. There's wonderful things done with it. But it's comparing apples and elephants when you talk about this process and, and digital or any of these analog or historic processes, whatever, whatever terminology you want to use. Yes, you become a better photographer. I agree with that, John. Yes, you, 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 you're not lazy. You're committed. You've got time. You've got money. You've got frustration. You're usually working with light that's changing constantly. And so there's a lot of factors that... Uh, it's a lot more difficult to make things happen um, uh, chemically, light. You got your chemistry, you got your light, and you got your uh, your head and your heart. And you've, you've got to work all in your lens, your optic, your chemistry, and your light. And you've got to work all those together, and you've got to get it all done uh, within the time frame that the, the plate either dries up or... or uh, you drop and break it or <laughs> something crazy like that. So that's a wonderful thing, Marcus. He says planning sometimes for two weeks for one image. That, I think that, that says a lot about people's attitude. Um, I've got a question, right? Like Socrates walked around the, the marketplace and he'd walk up, he said, he'll ask some young, guy, young person, hey, what is justice? Uh, and my question is, is what is value? What do we value anymore? How do we value things, right? And you'll see study after study that when human beings are handed things without any effort, they have very little value. It's just plain and simple. It makes complete sense. <laughs> the more pain, the more gain. <laughs> there you go, Dave. Um, and that's true. So when you work for something, especially something you care about and you want to accomplish, the rewards and the satisfaction and that the dopamine released in your brain is so much better. You know, you only want to get those dopamine releases on really good stuff, not little tiny pings all the time. It, it, it numbs you down. It desensitizes you. So absolutely, plan and work and, and enjoy the journey, Beverly. You're, you're going to love it. Yes, it, it is. It's the most wonderful thing to see that accomplished, successful, the way you want it. And... And you know, people think failure is bad. Failure is not bad, especially in these processes. Fail. Don't be afraid to say, "Hey, I failed." I, I you know, this. I fail all the time. I, 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 I embrace it. I, I try, you know, I try to get to the point where I don't fail. But failure is a part of that process, right? Uh, getting to the point where you don't fail. Um, yeah, everybody knows the, the feeling. If you've worked in wet clothing or any variants thereof, or uh, some of the more difficult in printing out processes or pigment processes. Um, everyone knows the difficulty in doing this. And, you know, if, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of like the digital craze. That's why I don't even know, from the commercial standpoint, I don't even know how a person uh, competes digital, uh, digitally, commercially now. I mean, tens of thousands of people making... Man, these, these, the, the algorithms and the software and the cameras they have, my God, you can, you can replicate anything, anything uh, with a push of a button, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a, it, I always said that if wet collodion gives me anything before I even did any projects in it, if wet collodion gives me anything, I know it will give me this. 
it will give me the advantage rather than just being another blade of grass among thousands and tens of thousands of blades of grass. My one little blade of grass will stand out just a little bit. And it, it, it proved to be true because you can't fake it. You can't come in here. You can't just buy a camera and a piece of software and be like everybody else. You actually have to work for it. And, and, and people know now um, what's fake and what's real. So it's a, it's a good thing. Oh, Curry, he put, he put a, a, a link up there. Failure is an option. Awesome. Check that out, you guys. That's great. What a great conversation. It's 1130 here in the Denver metro area. I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday or Sunday or whatever you're doing or evening, morning, afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me today. I, I had a wonderful time. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want more information, be feel, feel free to write me. Be, be uh, open to drop me a note. Um, and uh, I appreciate all your support. Um, every people that have supported me over the years, buying books, going to workshops, galleries, prints and plates, all of that, you're wonderful. Thank you so much. I couldn't do any of this without you. So you're a part of this too, and I appreciate it. So thank you. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon. Stay safe, and we'll see you Wednesday. We're going to roll some prints out, oil prints. Ciao. Take care.